Hello and welcome, this is Paul Sandu. So doing my usual morning drive and uh, giving thanks to the Lord God for his beautiful creation and for the fact that he made us. You know, one thing I realize in Psalm 8, for example, when it says, when the wonderful Psalmist King David, he asked that question, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Now, you know, that is an amazing statement that God's mind is full of the thoughts of man. Now, generally speaking, when man thinks about man, you know, we always think negative thoughts about each other. Okay, we are filled with jealousy, rage, envy, hatred, whatever, you know, and that is because, you know, there's very little that is likable or lovable about man, okay? Man is corrupt to the core. We have souls that are, are rotten, you know, in the, in Isaiah, the prophet said, you know, that uh, the whole body is full of putrefying sores. And that, I guess, applies to the soul and spirit of man as well. Yet the Bible tells us that God is mind. What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the reason is that man holds a very, very special place in God's creation. This creation that I'm driving through. And uh, it is all very, very beautiful. And uh, this, to me, reveals the beauty of the Creator. Some, the mind that can actually imagine all this and bring it into existence, it's got to be beautiful. And then I look at myself, you know, and I'm, I'm a wonder, you know, like I'm fearfully and wonderfully made again, wrote the Psalmist. Okay, and that is true. You know, what we are, we are just so magnificent, yet our lives are wasted in mundane things you know we think about silly things that again like i said we get filled with envy and jealousy and rage and hatred and murder okay we don't think thoughts of joy and peace and contentment and giving of thanks to him who had made us and put us here and once more people always question god especially when they're having problems in life but you know what the answer is quite simple. For one thing, God said, you know, I'm the potter and you are the clay. I can make you whatever I want to, okay? But just because we have some problems, we need to look beyond the problems and we need to look at God. That if he has allowed these problems, because the Bible says God will not allow you to be tempted more than you're able to endure, then therefore there has to be a reason for it, okay? So in the midst of my trials and temptations, what should I do? I should give thanks. So this is not the reason why, though, I wanted to make this video. Yes, I give thanks. And uh, it, is, uh, it is good to give thanks unto the Lord. In everything, give thanks, the Bible tells us. You know, the air that we breathe, he made it. If he didn't have this air, we wouldn't be able to survive, right? The food that we ate, it comes out of the ground that he made. Everything, this coat that I'm wearing, it, it is out of the materials that were out of this earth. Nothing, despite all the fake stories about science that, you know, they can go to asteroids and all that nonsense, everything that man uses comes from this very earth. And God has put it all there for our use and our benefit. So yes, so we need to give thanks because our survival depends entirely on Him and not on ourselves, okay? We like to take credit for everything that we are and everything that we have, but that is not the truth. The truth is that everything we are, He has made us. And everything we have, He has made it possible for, for us to have all that. So this is the reason why we should always be thankful. Now yesterday I posted a video on the pre-tribulation, pre-tribulation, let's look at the words here the pre-tribulation rapture that it is a lie, okay? First of all, the word rapture, like I said, it does not exist in the Bible. So that in, it, in and of itself should raise red flags. So what I like to use is the term that's used in the Bible, which is the gathering together of the elect, okay? So the gathering together of the elect is an event that takes place up in the air, okay? Here, somewhere, up in the heaven above us in the space that we see in this, you know, uh, this air, this atmosphere, you could say, right above us. That's where it takes place. It does not take place on the earth, and it does not take place in heaven. 
this is also significant in my belief and I have you know taught about it a little bit in the past that the reason this gathering together takes place in the air between heaven and earth and not in heaven and not on the earth is because what is taking place is a new creature is being brought into existence which is a spirit flesh creature okay the earth represents flesh the heaven represents spirit okay so this new creature is neither just spirit nor is he just flesh he is both therefore this union it is appropriate that the union of the spirit and of the flesh takes place up in the air above between heaven and earth and in neither one of those places okay so yes so the gathering together is an actual biblical event but the question is when does this gathering together the elect take place and as i have like numerous videos on my channel if you know before you debate me you should watch all of them okay you should because i believe there's plenty of evidence in it to actually disprove this pre-tribulation gathering let's say because i don't like to use the word rapture very very clearly explicitly it can be disproven that this is a false doctrine okay so in matthew i think it's in matthew 24 33 34 35 somewhere around there where it tells us that immediately after the tribulation of those days certain things will happen okay, before this gathering takes place so when we go through these events as they are told to us in the bible then it becomes clear that the pre-tribulation rapture or the pre-tribulation gathering is a lie that it is a post-tribulation event which means that believers are going to be required to go through the tribulation just as Jesus told us very plainly in the world you shall have tribulation in Revelation he told them that you shall have tribulation for 10 days all right so Jesus told us right that we shall have tribulation 10 days and later on in those letters to the churches in the book of Revelation in chapter 2 and 3 the Lord Jesus said to the church in Philadelphia that I will keep you from the hour of temptation that shall come upon the whole world. Okay. So first he told us that we shall have tribulation 10 days. Then he told us that we shall be kept from the hour of temptation. Therefore, we need to put these things in perspective. That the time period of the tribulation that we will be required to go through is much, much greater then the time that Jesus promised us he would keep us or guard us or protect us from which is so you have 10 days and even if you know in those times they has they said there were 12 hours in a day but 10 days is 120 hours okay so tribulation is 120 hours so Jesus basically told them that you're gonna have tribulation for 120 hours then the 121st hour which is the very end of the tribulation is what he is going to save us from, which is not even the tribulation. It is actually the pouring out of God's wrath. That is that time. That is also the time which Jesus told us about in Matthew, that those days will be shortened for the elect's sake. Otherwise, no flesh should be saved. So by that time, when this event, this hour of temptation comes, Anyhow, I keep getting interrupted here, but that's uh, what I wanted to mention was that, that this uh, idea of having uh, the temptation or the hour trial of the world, it is one hour, which is a very short period of time. I will say maybe no more than about 45 days and it could only be 30 days. But in these days, where everything that is going to happen, which is the judgments of the vials in Revelation 16, the judgment of the great whore mystery Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18 this will take place within that period of time okay so that period of time from Revelation 16 17 and 18 the elect of God will not be on the earth because God has promised us that he will keep us from it okay but in order to get to that place First of all, we have to go all the way from Matthew 24, 7 and 8, the beginning of sorrows, 
all the way down into Revelation chapter 13 and 14 which is unto the appearance of the Antichrist. This is a rather lengthy period of time and there are so much going on. The world is going to be wrecked and destroyed and probably by the time of Revelation 16, I would venture to say that some 90% of the people will already have been killed off, which is why Jesus said that the last days will be shortened, otherwise no flesh will be saved. So there will be not much flesh left to save there anyhow okay so it is in that period of time within those 10 days of tribulation within those 120 hours that most of us are already going to be dead so we are not going to be alive to see the return of jesus christ okay we won't be and that's the mindset we need to have that you know we are going to be required to be faithful unto death that we are going to be required to lay our lives down okay that our faith is going to be tested even to the point of giving up our lives it is and therefore we need to be ready that's all we need to be ready for that forget about this pre-tribulation rapture it is not going to happen it is not going to happen there are some other things that this person wrote, okay, he wrote a comment, somebody wrote a comment, and they said, you know, why would you say that people that believe in the pre-tribulation pre rapture are going into damnation? First of all, I didn't say that, okay? People need to hear. That's what Jesus kept saying. He, they have ears to hear and eyes to see. When people read the Word of God, they read into it. When they hear my videos, they put words in my mouth which I didn't say okay and secondly he said that Jesus is not gonna make a stop in the middle to gather everybody up he's just gonna keep coming down for Armageddon well that is not what the Bible says that is not what the Bible teaches my friend so I'm going to try and answer your question scripturally and if you take your Bible and you read along what I'm teaching you you will see that there is a pause after the time of this Antichrist in Revelation 13 and before we get to Revelation 16 there is a pause it is even mentioned in Revelation 15 I believe where it says that in heaven there was silence for about the space of half an hour you understand that there is going to be a period of time which is going to be something like maybe Fifteen days or so that is going to be a pause and I'll tell you what is the purpose of that pause I apologize you know that when I'm driving that uh, there are certain things I need to list out and to show you each scripture which means that I should be sitting down somewhere and doing this on a computer rather than on my phone here but at the same time I want to put these thoughts down so that this actually helps me too because as I'm doing these videos whatever these this information which is in here it is being brought out and one day God willing soon when I have the time I'm going to collate it all and I am going to make those videos which are going to show you scripturally scripture after scripture after scripture that this is what the Bible is teaching us okay so according to this person this is this is the events okay, that this uh, rapture has taken place and Jesus just come down straight to earth uh, 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 that is not what the Bible teaches in Matthew 24 what do we read that after the tribulation of those days the Sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not shall give her light and the stars shall withdraw their shining and basically he is saying that one major event is going to take place which is that the lights that are in the sky which God put up there the Sun moon and the stars they will not be shining which means that the heaven above will be like a black canvas it will be totally dark okay but that in itself is a major sign is it not is it not for people who are watching and praying like we've been told to that they will know that this is a time when our redemption has drawn very close and then it says then 
shall appear in heaven the sign of the son of man okay well how can something appear if it's totally dark and you can't see then it can't appear right so it stands to reason that this sign is is a light of some sort like the star that appeared at christ's first coming this is also going to be a star i believe except i believe it is going to be much brighter because you, when the star in Bethlehem appeared, the other stars had not withdrawn their shining. The sun was still shining, the moon was still up there, okay? So that was an event that was only known to a very few. This one, however, is going to take place against a darkened sky, completely dark, black like this jacket that I'm wearing, okay? And then when this light shines, it is going to be blinding. And those who are watching, they're going to know that this is the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, that he is above us now. But does that mean that he comes right down to earth and does Armageddon? No, that's not what the Bible says. That is not what the Bible says. He said, then he will send out his angels and they will gather his elect together from one end of heaven to the other and from the earth, okay? So again, if he is gathering together all the elect from the heaven and the earth, they're obviously not in heaven, right? They're not in heaven. They're not on the earth either. The Lord Jesus is in between heaven and earth in the air. That's where the gathering is taking place. So is there a stop in Jesus' coming, second coming, where he stops above us? Absolutely. That's what the Bible teaches not just in Matthew 24. What do we read in, in 1 Thessalonians, which is always chapter four, which is, you know, which is uh, shown as a major evidence for the pre-tribulation rapture. What does it say? For well, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. So he's not in heaven if he's descending from heaven, is he? He's no longer in heaven, right? He's coming down. The Lord himself will defend, descend from heaven with a shout. So is that a silent secret coming? No. He's coming with a shout. And with the voice of the archangel. When you think the archangel gives out his voice, like when they went to battle and they had the heralds that had made the announcement, do you think people will hear? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, with the voice of the archangel. And this archangel may well be the one that we see in, uh, in Revelation 14 that is going to preach the gospel, which is going to command people to repent. Why? Because the sign of Son of Man is already here and he's telling people, hey, Jesus is here. And yet the world will not believe him. Okay? It's the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. The trump, the trumpet is sounding. So you got the Lord is shouting, the voice of the archangel is giving his voice. The trumpet is being blown and this is a secret rapture. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? You really believe that? Come on, man. Anyhow, and then what does it say? And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And again, I told you that, what that means that the dead in Christ shall rise first, okay? It is in my teaching on Thessalonians, but I won't go into it here. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up with the Lord in the air. Where does the gathering take place? This person that told me, he wrote this comedy, he said, you know, Jesus is going to come shoom, down to earth and do arm again. Really? No. It is telling us that this event is taking place in Thessalonians itself, which you guys use as a pre-tribulation rapture, that he is going to come. He is going to be up in the air. He's going to gather together his elect, just like he told you in, in Matthew 24, just like he told you in Revelation 14, that he's going to use a sharp sickle and he's going to reap. There are two reapings in, in Revelation 14, okay? One is the reaping of those which are his elect. One is the reaping of those that are going to be sent into the wine press of God's wrath, which comes in Revelation 16, 17, and 18. See, the Bible is so plain. The word of God tells us, you know, my words are plain to him that understands. Plain, 
plain, plain, plain. And the, this, this year, especially what the prophet Daniel told us with the days and the numbers that he gave us, you know, he gave us a total of 1,335 days, which will be the period of the very, very end. And I will one day go into that period of time. That's where we can figure out when will the sign of the Son of Man appear? When will this pause take place? Which we are told about in, in uh, the pause. The, there was silence in heaven for the space of about half an hour, okay? Which is the pause. What is this pause? This pause is when the sign of the Son of Man appears, okay? It appears above us. Like I said, darkened sky, light comes on. It's like, you know, you go into a, you're in a, in a dark room and, you know, your eyes, you can't see anything. You're, you're blind as a bat, like they say. And suddenly the most brilliant light shines. Is it going to blind you? That's what's going to happen, okay? That's what's going to happen. And what? God is a merciful God. He has told us that that is the sign of the Son of Man. Okay? And people, the angel will be flying around to tell you this, that this is who it is. Yet the world will not believe it. God is merciful. He will yet give the world a last chance, repent and believe. But they won't. And then will be poured out his wrath. This is that pause where Jesus is above us, but yet he will not come down to earth immediately. So please don't tell me that he is going to come shoo, like come and start Armageddon. It won't happen. The Bible does not teach us that. It doesn't. In three passages, Matthew 24, and again Luke and Mark as well. Okay, but I will go through those separately. But in Matthew 24, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and in Revelation 14, it is the same scripture being described that an event is taking place above us between heaven and earth where we can see the Son of Man. His clouds are visible, his light is visible, his sign is visible. And those who are watching and praying know that it's him. And they will be the ones, they are the wise virgins, they will be gathered up to him. And then what happened? Do they take back off to heaven? Uh, 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 uh. No, sir. No, sir. Then while they are up there, the vials of God's wrath are opened. Okay? The judgment of Revelation 16, 17, and 18 takes place. All this has happened. And then the final. Then they come down to earth to battle at Armageddon and destroy the armies of the earth under this Antichrist. Okay, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their coats from us, but he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, he shall hold them in derision. That is that event. But Jesus who is sitting up here and he's watching and he's sending forth his message that this is me now repent and believe. And they say, no, we're going to gather our armies. We got our air force and we got our, you know, big guns and everything. We're ready to battle you. Okay. And the kings of the earth, by the way, my friends, especially you down in the U.S., it includes your president as well. Okay. It does. The queen, the pope, they're all included in there. They will all be waging war against the Lord God. Don't you ever believe that any politician is a godly person that does There is no such thing in this world today. There is no righteous king or ruler in this world anywhere, anywhere. They are all, they are all sold out to Satan and beholden to him. Okay, so they will be there to do battle. And then, of course, Jesus will destroy them in an instant, literally obliterate them. And then he will come down to the earth and that will be his second coming. But is that an instantaneous event? Absolutely not. See, prophecy is so exciting when you understand it the way it is written in the Bible. That yeah, the sign is going to appear. The tribulation will have taken place. Most of us already have been killed off or be dead. Which is a good thing. You know, what do you want to stick around for all the mess that is on this earth? This earth is a big mess anyhow. So, you know, what do we want to stick around for to see more wickedness and more evil? No, the world is going to get worse and worse, as the Bible tells us. So, so we'll be better off. It's far better to be with the Lord, to come down with Him from heaven and come here, come back to earth with Him. Okay, that's going to be much better. So, most of us will be dead. 
we won't even make it to the time of the Antichrist. So you know, quit trying to figure out who's the Antichrist, it won't happen. So this person, one of the questions that he had, okay, I get a little bit excited when I talk about these things, so I'm not, you know, angry at you or whatever for your understanding that, you know, that you have, you've been mistaught. So hopefully, you'll open your Bible, you look at those scriptures, and you will study, and you will see that there is a huge difference in what the pre-trib rapture crowd teaches and what the Bible actually teaches, okay? And the second information, the second point that he was trying to make, actually his first point was that why are you telling people that they're going to go into damnation? That is not what I said. What I said was that this pre-tribulation lying is a very pernicious doctrine and that it is going to lead many people into perdition. And then I went on to explain to, uh, to uh, in that video why. And what I said was that if people believe in this, what do they believe that they are going to be saved from the tribulation, right? Okay, so you've been brainwashed into believing that, you know, you're going to be caught up before all the trouble starts, okay? This is what they teach you, right? Oh, after the letters of Revelation 3, you know, the church is no longer there. Jesus wrote those letters to the churches, and at the end of the book, he repeats that, that this information, the whole book, is meant for the churches. So if you think the church is not going to be here, my friend, you are deluded and you are deceived. And what did Jesus warn us? In Matthew 24, in Luke 21, throughout the letters that he wrote in uh, to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3, warnings not to be deceived, not to be deceived, not to be deceived, not to be deceived. Okay? The end is not yet. The end is not yet. The end is not yet. Which means, you know, you got more to go through. You got more to go through. You got more to go through. Don't look for the end. The beginning of sorrows happens. There's always a little bit of a pause between each each uh, major stage in the end of the world, as described in Matthew and also in the book of Revelation in particular. Like for example, between the opening of the seals and the sounding of the trumpets, there's going to be a little bit of a pause. And it is that pause that people will use to say, oh, it's over now, it's over. Oh, Jesus is coming now, he's gonna rapture me out of here. But it won't happen because Jesus told you the end is not yet. You got further to go. Your trials are just beginning. Now they're going to get the, the fires are going to be even hotter that you will need to go through. Okay? But people will keep on saying, no, 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 no. He's coming now. You know, you're going to be caught up now. You're going to be caught up now. What does that do? What does that do when you have been believing this all your life and it does not happen? What does that do? What did Jesus say? When the heat is turned up, the love of many is going to wax cold, okay? They are going to melt like wax and they're going to run with the tails between their legs. And what will they do? What will happen to them? Well, what will happen is that their... What will happen, my friends, is that uh, their love will wax cold, their faith will get shipwrecked, that they will leave their first love, okay? They will leave their first love. And what did Jesus say to you in the letters when he said that if you leave your first love, what's gonna happen? Your name will be blotted out of the book of life. So when I tell you that this doctrine is a very pernicious doctrine, if you keep believing in it, it is a danger that you're going to be led into perdition because your love is going to wax cold and this person wrote, you know, why do you say that this is not a salvation issue? Now, this is another topic on which I never really have given much thought. You know, people say, oh, this is not a salvation issue. But now that I think about it, you know, everything is a salvation issue. Faith is a salvation issue. Okay. What Jesus had told you that you must believe in, you have to believe in from the beginning to the end. In Hebrews, you can read that, that you have to hold steadfast to the end of that faith. If you let go at any point in time, you are in danger. Now, God is not unrighteous that he just lets you go just like that. He doesn't. Okay, He is going to make, give it, like, you know, give you, how many chances did Jesus tell them? 70 times 7, even in a day? He is going to give us chance after chance after chance after chance after chance. But, but there may come a time, day when the time for you will run out. Because you did not believe what God told you. 
that is faith is. Your faith is not just, you know, okay, I believe in Jesus Christ, but I don't believe everything else that's written in the Bible. I don't believe that he said that he can, I might have to be killed for my faith. No. Oh, really? No, that's what the Bible teaches you, that you have to be faithful unto death. Okay? And when you stop believing that, and you start, start believing in this fake rescue mission that is coming when it doesn't materialize, there is grave danger that your love is going to wax cold. And like Jesus warned that when you leave your first love, you know, you are not saved from the second death anymore. You are not. Your name will be blotted out of the book of life. That is how grave that danger is. Therefore, people take their salvation too lightly. And I taught that in the once saved, always saved false doctrine. Don't. You know, so I don't want to hear this, or this is not a salvation issue. Yes, everything is a salvation issue. Okay? Because your salvation depends on your faith. And your faith is in the Word of God. Okay? Read Hebrews 4. Read it. What happened to those Israelites? Okay? It depends on that. So, first of all, I didn't say that you know, anybody that believes in the pre tribulation rapture is going into damnation. I said, I said that if you continue to believe in it, it is going to lead you into perdition. And why? Because you will leave your first love. Your love will wax cold because you know you're believing in this rescue which does not come. And then you go, Oh, Jesus lied to me. He said he's gonna come and take me, and he didn't, you know. I don't believe him in any longer and when you no longer believe in him then my friends he is not obligated to save you any longer that is what I was saying this is the reason why this is a very very pernicious and dangerous doctrine okay and I warn people against it that you are believing in a false hope which God has not given us we believe in the hope that God gives us but if God has not given us that hope like you know in the time of the prophets what happened read Jeremiah R you know all these prophets are running around saying oh the rescue is coming God is going to save us you know that uh, what was it one of this uh, Hananiah or something one of those false prophets at the time of Jeremiah well, within two full years, you know, God is going to restore this kingdom and the temple and all the, the treasures that have been stolen by Nebuchadnezzar are going to come back. No, sir, he was a false prophet. He gave people false hope. Oh, don't listen to Jeremiah because he's warning you to, you know, repent and to change and to humble yourself. Don't believe in him. God is going to rescue you. And it was a false hope. It was a false hope. Jerusalem fell. People, the fall of Jerusalem at that time was such a horrific event. You can read the book of Lamentations, okay? I can't even begin to imagine it, but even reading it breaks my heart, okay? But this is my friends. This, my friends, is what I'm trying to teach you, is that the Bible is plain. Like he had a question that, you know, Jesus is just going to come down. It doesn't happen, not in the Bible. He's asking me, you know, why do you say that people go, you know, you're going to be damnation? Well, because the one thing is that uh, this uh, pre-tribulation rapture doctrine is a damnable heresy. It is. And I need to warn you against it. Whether you believe the warning or not is up to you. Just like most people did not believe the warnings of the prophet Jeremiah, they didn't. They hated him. They threw him in a dungeon. And people hate me for it, like, you know, just going by the dislikes that I'm getting on this video. Then I told them that, you know, hey, the pre-tribulation rapture is a lie. And you know, more dislikes on this one than probably any of my videos, but it's okay. You can dislike it all you want. I will still tell you the truth that is in the scriptures. I will still tell you the truth that is spoken by the word of God, okay? I will, I will 100% not give in to any doctrine of man. I won't do it because then I'm gonna have to answer to God one day and I'm not gonna give you. I'll make it tougher for you than anything else. Uh, you know, I, I, I'll pray, if anything, I will exaggerate the danger that you're in. And although that's not possible to do that because, you know, perdition is a danger that we are all in, except we hang on to our faith. Okay, if we are faithful unto the end, that's our be thou faithful unto death, the Bible tells us. 
I mean, how much more clear can Jesus make it when he told you to be faithful unto death? How much more? And yet you believe in the pre-tribulation rapture? What more can be said in the topic? Well, I will. I'm going to do a teaching, like I said, you know, with the scriptures because these timelines are becoming clearer to me. Clearer to me. And I'm thankful for that. I can everything give thanks. I'm thanks for the understanding that comes from my Heavenly Father only. I don't uh, know why He gives me this understanding, but I appreciate it, I value it, and I share it. But, as I told you, don't take my word for it. If you had watched all my videos on the pre-tribulation rapture, you probably wouldn't have these questions. Okay, so go ahead. They are good teaching tools. Okay, I'm not tooting my own horn. I'm just telling you that, you know, my videos are good teaching tools. If you take your King James Bible and you watch the videos and you study along with it, it will benefit you. It will benefit you. It will help you. A lot of people write to me and it tells them it helps their understanding and it is helping them grow. And that is why. That is what the Word of God should do. It is food, right? It is soul food. That's what it is. It is food for your soul and spirit. It should nourish you. It should make you grow. That's why people that have been sitting in churches for 40 years don't grow. Because they are fed the same milk over and over and over and over again. And by the time they get to be 40, the milk is so stale and curdled that instead of bringing nourishment, it actually kills them. Okay? Anyhow, I think I'll stop now. I'm almost at my work here. But thanks for listening. And uh, again, give thanks to Lord. Give thanks in everything. Give thanks for this is the will of God. Okay? It is. It is the will of God that we give thanks to Him in everything. And you know what? Why not? Why not? What is it that we have and what is it that we are that we can claim credit for? Nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Nothing. If you are in a place of destitution, be thankful for that as well. Because in the end, you will see, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Because you will have a reward which you can't even begin to imagine at this moment in time. Okay, this is Paul Sandu.
there shall be wars and rumors of war. Nation shall rise against nation, destroying all creation. Super rockets and bombing jets. Riots will break out in the streets. The man will come down on your head with a club. Famine, starvation shall sweep the earth. People killing people. Hatred, murder, and fear shall linger in every heart. Earthquakes and missiles. Falling bombs. Children will betray fathers and mothers. The end will be near. Then shall rise the Antichrist with a number for your forehead. Six, six, six. And a number for your wrist. And darkness shall fall across the face of the earth. The stars shall fall from the sky. The moon shall turn red. And if you name the name of Christ, you'll be killed. Then Jesus Christ will come again.